Ah, what better way to start to talk about the contextual behavioral sciences than with some reggae? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, works for me. Works for you. Welcome back to another episode of uh, Act Root to Fruit. Uh, my name is Marcel, and I am really working hard to excavate the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences so that the fruit that we deliver to our clients is as pristine as possible. And I'm thrilled to have another guide. And I, I love your backyard, I have to say. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah. I'm pretending this is my backyard <laughs> for today. But so, but it's very fitting because because my the image I have of what I'm doing here is is guide. I'm, I am I'm I'm seeking guides to help me go through the thick that's behind you. And so, thank you for for Sonia Batten for being my guide today. Welcome. Sure, my pleasure. And yeah, I think you can in this uh, image behind me. You can sort of imagine it's it's multi layered. Some growth has is, is been there a long time, some's recent, yeah. you know, there probably are some scary, dirty things underneath, and then some beautiful flowers, and who knows what's what's on the other side. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's, I'm excited. I'm really excited about that journey. Um, so, so Sonia is a uh, um, health consultant psychologist with a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and experience, and I... Um, um, we'll be, we'll be talking about some of the work that you do along the way. And, and, you know, you've got a wonderful website and, and you are a fellow in the association for the contextual behavioral sciences. Some of you have seen her on stage every year at the, at the world conference. And actually I have a question about that. What's that? So you're at the follies. We're talking about the follies, right? And, uh, so the question I have is, uh, just true or false that you aren't, you didn't host this year since, you know, this is going to be aired after the conference. You didn't host this year because of your conflict hosting the Oscars. Is that? <laughs> yes. They, they hold me to a strict one hosting policy. Okay. So yeah. I, I decided to mix it up for this year. And, and, and also, you know, I think there's an, I want to, I have another true or false question around that. Is it true or false that, you finally have extinguished your social anxieties and you're no longer in need of doing the follies anymore. And that's why you've, you've renounced. Yeah. Well, you know, I, as I've, as I've uh, come to realize I'm, there's not a microphone uh, that I'm not friendly with um, except in front of Congress. So I, I haven't oh, extinguished really? that one, but yeah. Have you, you've been there, huh? I have. I oh, have. wow. Wow. How was, can we talk, can you, how was the anxiety there? It is, um, it is an interesting experience. Um, def definitely um, more anxious there than other places because you realize that there are other forces in play other than just being an expert in something and, and answering direct questions. It's, that's not quite all there is to it. Yeah. What were you doing there? Um, that was when I was in my role as a um, national policy lead for the mm. Department of Veterans Affairs, yeah. and they were doing a hearing on veteran mental health issues. Okay. Very, very. That's, that's uh, fantastic. And, yeah, you uh, can go look, go look it up on C-SPAN if, if you okay. got a couple hours to <laughs> listen to a 10-year-old hearing. All right. All right. Uh, so, so, yeah, there's... That's enough of an introduction, I think, and and, uh, and yeah. you're uh, um, so so. I thought maybe we're going to talk today about some about the the act stance, and uh, I thought I thought maybe just on this note because because of maybe your your work in in the follies, we could we could like do some translation of of some things. If I could throw some 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 lyrics at you, maybe some some common refrains, and you could kind of translate those into CBS speak. Okay. I'll okay. Try. All right. Luckily, I was also in an improv troupe ah. for a couple of years. So long, we'll, long form we'll, or short form? Primarily short form. Okay. All right. I love improv. Yeah. I was actually I was actually signed up to start taking a class April first. Oh. No. Yeah. I'm sure they're doing some online ones at this point. I'm sure yeah, some I of the do. the groups have pivoted to that. Yeah, I think one more online Zoom meeting, and I will. <laughs> I just can't. I just can't. Okay. 
So, so we could go different. You could go any way you want with this. Um, okay. And uh, let's see what happens. All right. All right. But because because I think the the functional functional contextual perspective is so unique and so destabilizing, as I talk with Joanne about that. It, this you know, while this might be humorous, it might be helpful to kind of to just to just think about perspectives through that lens common perspective. Okay. Okay. Sure. And, and you know what, I'll, I'll give just a tiny bit of background about myself, which is that I trained in clinical psychology at university of Nevada, Reno. So with Steve Hayes okay. and, yeah. and you who know, was my, that? Who? I, I, maybe you've heard of him, Stephen <laughs> Hayes with the, the one with a C. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, I mean, is I was, I was super young when I started graduate yeah. school and it's really like the, um, it was part of my growing up into adulthood. And so it's, um, the stance is something that was sort of coached into me by, yeah. you know, Steve and my fellow students, Kelly and, and Robin and others. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it'll be interesting to hear you can throw out common things. And I, the only way I have of looking at those things is from a contextual behavior okay. perspective. Okay. So, um, thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Sure. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Please stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. I know that you're going to have it your way or nothing at all, but I think you're moving too fast. Um, all right. And so what am I supposed to be doing with this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be applying that to the. Yeah. The help us see that through. Act a, therapeutic. Well, yeah. If we would put it in a functional, because, you know, I was talking to Miranda Morris the other day and she said something I really, I really love. And she said something about how her RFT speak is her, her RFT speak is heavily accented and she's okay with that. It's that just, you know, um, so I th I'm just thinking about the language. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, so I don't know if I'm going to do what you're asking me to do, but I mean, what, what that makes me think of mm -hmm. is that, um, in terms of the act therapeutic stance, you actually, you actually want to be, um, okay with being unstable, that trying to stick with the rivers and the lakes that you're used to, I, I think, um, doesn't allow for the flexibility that you need um, in, in working with your clients, because if you have a certain agenda of where you think things need to go mm -hmm. and where, what you're comfortable with, um, that means that you're probably not actually listening to what the client is bringing, paying attention to their values and, and figuring out, you know, where, where to go next. Okay. Thank you. In your head, in your head. Zombie, zombie, zombie. What's in your head? In your head. Zombie, zombie, zombie. Okay, again, not sure if I'm, I'm <laughs> doing what you're asking me to. Um, but so, okay, so in terms of the, the ACT therapeutic um, relationship, it is what you're doing with the relationship is actually modeling for the client how they can choose to relate to the things that are in their head. Mm -hmm. And so when they're throwing something out about the, the really challenging content that's in their head, um, you have a choice. You can either go with the content or you can model for them that whatever content is there is okay. And so they may, you know, they, they've got some zombies going through their head mm -hmm. that may feel pretty scary. And by you not overreacting to the zombies that they, that they bring up, you can perhaps demonstrate to them a new way of, of responding to their own content. Mm. Um, perhaps, perhaps something that, that they couldn't have even imagined. Yeah. I thank you. And, and what about, what, what, what brings up for me that, that word zombie in terms of like my own value judgments around those who are kind of living as zombies, you know, who are kind of checked out. I think that's something that, uh, is, uh, is difficult. It's difficult for me in working with someone who I'm, I'm seeing as just living through the screens and, uh, um, yeah. What, 
could we talk more about that in terms of the act stance, you know? And I guess it doesn't really matter what the topographical behavior is. Basically, I'm saying, you know, something that they're doing, I don't agree with, and I want to move them in a different direction. Okay. Well, first of all, in act, we're, we're not deciding what is the way that, that whether we agree with or not yeah. and what direction they need to go. So first and foremost, it's about what, I mean, we're sort of a, without opinion mm -hmm. about what is the way they should go because the direction of their lives and of therapy is defined by their own values. So unless their values somehow relate to harming themselves or others, which I've never seen, mm -hmm. um, really like we're, we're there for whatever it is that they want to do with their lives. So the first thing, you know, when you talk about sort of the, going through their lives as a zombie, often what that makes me think of is somebody who is not in contact with their own values. Okay. And, and so we might first spend some time understanding what their values are, where they want their lives to go. Mm -hmm. And then we have radical respect for whatever those values are and how we can help them mm -hmm. live more mindfully and purposefully. Okay. And that, but that isn't that mindfulness living more mindfully kind of imposing something on them potentially. Couldn't it? Well, I'm not saying living more mindfully in the sense of that they have to practice any specific approach to mindfulness. What I'm saying is living in a in a way that is more aware and where they are making more active choices about what their life is and what they're doing in any given moment. So going from that automatic response of, mm -hmm. of a zombie to something where they're faced with similar opportunities or threats or whatever, mm -hmm. and they, um, with open eyes, recognize what's there in front of them, what do their values tell them to do, and, mm -hmm. then, and then make a choice. Okay. And what, what's unique about the ACT or CBS stance for you compared to other, other modalities? Well, I, I think what I was just talking about is is that um, that radical openness and um, the non-judgmentalness mm -hmm. and having everything totally driven by the client um, in a way that you know there that's the functional part of functional contextual. The functional means it's what works. It's yeah. def and how is what works defined? It's defined by the client's values and what's important to them. So you could end up working with a client on completely different types of behaviors mm -hmm. that would topographically look very different. And functionally, they would be in the service of moving the client's life forward. Okay. And what that brings up for me in terms of the stance is, you know, there's there's a lot to cover with a client. And if my, I'm wondering, I'm just going to pose this, is, is if my stance is one of flexibility, I'm, I'm not kind of automatically just going to one, one, one of the, let's say one of the core processes. I'm, 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 I'm open to what, what's functionally most appropriate for the client. Yeah, I think when you get to the point of of competence in mm -hmm. act, I, I think that's that's true. I I for people who are in training, I like to think about this concept of adherence versus competence, or not versus, but adherence and competence. Okay. And um, when somebody is first learning how to do act, I think it's um, sometimes more important to practice going through all of the processes mm -hmm. in an adherent way mm -hmm. so that you get them into your repertoire okay. because it's, it's easy to over time just do the things that you're comfortable with or the things that you like to do or that you think um, you're good at. And I think it's important first to be adherent and able to apply mm -hmm. all of the, the core processes. And yes, then once, once you have that and you, you have all of those things in your repertoire, then developing you know, a, a good, strong case conceptualization for each individual client. Mm -hmm. And then in a 
what I mean by competence is the ability to flexibly apply those different processes mm -hmm. based on each individual case conceptualization um, and, and what's present then in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So it's, 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 it's really, I mean, it's, it's a new way of understanding humans for most of us and, and language and behavior. And it's really challenging. And just like anything challenging, it's, you know, we get some, we have some, we follow, we follow some format, maybe like you talked about, um, this and adherence. And then, and then we're able to move on to, to our own, figure out our own mastery of it, whatever that looks like. Right. And I just would sort of caution people to not just jump ahead to the part where I'm flexibly applying ACT principles, uh, you know, uh -huh. without doing the work of truly making sure that, that you understand and can apply the majority of the principles, because otherwise, um, you know, it can end up just sort of being this um, eclectic or unbalanced way mm -hmm. of a approaching the, the principles mm -hmm. without really being theory driven and, and having all of the, you know, all of the arrows in your quiver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's, that's who I'm um, speaking to. We're speaking to here is, is folks who have some, have started to, to get into the X pool and um, are, are working, working towards really um, what you just said. What you just said, and so that I'm hearing like this danger of of <clears throat> of kind of like uh, just not being not being where you are. It can be a little bit dangerous and in, in, in to 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 practice that way. I don't know about yeah, dangerous. I mean, that's I, a strong I, word, but just you know, not adhering. Yeah, really that. yeah. I think that if if you're if you're learning act, I think what what can be really useful is to do some meaningful self-assessment mm. of where you are. Mm -hmm. And um, there are on the, the ACBS website, for example, um, there's a core competency form, um, or you can go through a book like Learning Act, and mm -hmm. you know they have other ways of, of assessing where you are in terms of the different skills and processes. And I, I think that self-awareness is really important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next song. Yeah. What you got? <laughs> hmm. I'm too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy for my shirt. So sexy it hurts. I'm too sexy for Milan. Too sexy for Milan. Uh, well, Milan is Milan is one of my. One of my favorite act places. It's where really? one of my buddies, you know, Nani Presti uh, is. Uh -huh. And so I've, uh -huh. I've spent some good act time with friends in Milan. So it's got some good associations for me. I don't know. I mean, what, what I hear in that is uh -huh. a um, an over-identification with self as content, mm. right? So if you think you're too sexy for your shirt, then that's going to prevent you from um, being able to you know, sort of flexibly do what you need to do it might get you in trouble. You might not be able to uh, comply with certain dress codes and then you might not be able to get where you want to go in life because sometimes you got to wear a shirt, you know, maybe the problem um, is the dress codes though. Well, it could be. And so I would not take an opinion on that. What I would do is ask you whether or not that understanding of the world is, is working for you mm. or not. And, and if it is, and, you know, it's leading you to important valued behaviors about changing dress codes, rock mm -hmm. on. Okay. Um, so I, have a, I have a question about this. Uh, and so, okay. So getting someone to see if something is working, um, I'm wondering how does ACT vary from um, motivational interviewing in that approach? Yeah, I, th I think it, it's very consistent with motivational okay. interviewing. Okay. I think it's very consistent. I think you could use a lot of the, the same types of um, questioning and looking at pros and cons and what's working and not working short term and long term. I think it's it's very consistent with that. Okay. The, the piece I think that ACT adds 
is an explicit focus on what is working or not working based on your values. So not, you know, based on your, you know, society's values, your religion's values, what your parents think, what your teachers think, Mm -hmm. that first you have to understand what you're sort of assessing something as working or not working against. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can use those, the same motivational interviewing principles. Okay. So we have to, we have to embody this stance. The stance is our stance. It's not what someone else needs to do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that is at the core. Yeah. I think what it means to be a competent act therapist is that same stance that were that same the same skills that we're asking our clients to try out and practice and employ we have to be applying those things ourselves as well Mm -hmm. because i think it is really not um it's not a genuine process otherwise Mm. you know if you're just reading the words from a book um, without yourself having tried to apply them and if you're working with a client on, well, you need to accept that that's part of your history and, you mm-hmm. know, there's nothing we can change about it. So it's time to move on. Well, like, look at all the times in your own life that it has been much easier said than done to just accept that something is the way it is and move on. You know, we all struggle. We all hold on to things. Mm-hmm. We all wish things were different. Um you know, there've been a lot of things about this pandemic that we have all had to work on accepting. Mm-hmm. And and when we can recognize that we're all human, we're all in the same boat, we, we all have those experiences. And a lot of these skills are easier said than done. You know, when, when you can get in contact with just how hard it is to do that sometimes, then I think you can approach the therapeutic work in a more grounded and genuine way. Mm. Ne- never ask the client to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I um, vividly remember leaving my first intensive act for a training, which was a boot camp, and just um, kind of picking apart people in my life who, who weren't you know, uh, seeing the world like I was now seeing the world. How did that work out for you? <laughs> well, it's taken me a few years to to recover from that, and I think I'm I think I'm almost there. You know, so so yeah, so um, um, assuming this act stance, seeing seeing that, I guess what came up for me as you were talking was the the uniqueness of of uh, act and the other CBS therapies in terms of the literature speaking towards our need. To, to kind of um, integrate this into our lives in comparison to other, other modalities that I've read. You know, I don't, I don't know that I've, you know, in other texts that I've read from other, other theories, they, they really talk about that. Yeah. I think that, that it probably varies. I mean, you could go all the way to the one extreme with psychoanalysis where you have to be in analysis yourself for years and years Mm -hmm. in order to be, you know, an appropriate psychoanalyst, all the way to applying very skills-based trainings where maybe you wouldn't have ever had to apply, you know, parenting skills yourself in order to teach parenting skills, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain things that that you might be able to teach quite well Mm -hmm. without having experienced them. Um, I would suggest that principles like acceptance and diffusion and committed action are things that that we all can apply to our own lives and that we will be more effective um, if you can come at it from that experience that shared human experience yeah yeah i agree i agree i'm wondering if maybe on this on this um topic of stance you know where uh, you're you do consultation and um just kind of wondering if, if maybe we could do a little bit of a, a a role play around some of that with me as a the consultee we can try we could try is that okay yeah, yeah. all right um so so one of the problems i struggle with in terms of the the stance is sometimes i'm tired and i just want to and my mind just wants me to like kind of check out 
Um, and it's like a battle to kind of really be present and active and wholehearted and, um, and I don't know how to be with that. Like, um, it's like, it's like my tiredness often wins. Like it doesn't, I don't know if it wins, but it's just like, it's very powerful, you know? And you're talking about in, in a session. Yeah. In a session. You know, and so what are, yeah, so what are you likely to, to do in those situations? I would say I'm, uh, likely to, um, maybe pay more attention to that or kind of like argue with that than I, well, I guess I, I, I don't feel as in tune with, with my client at that moment. You know, I'm not like we're you know, we're not riding the same wavelength. It doesn't, it doesn't feel that way to me. And, and, um, and I, and I worry about just the quality of, of uh, care that I'm providing, you know, um, like I know, I know what fully embodied present therapy is like and, 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 and I know what it's not, you know, the, 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 the opposite of that is like, and, uh, um, when I, when I do the opposite, it actually like, it's, it's like draining. And, um, so <clears throat> I don't know if there's a, if that answers your question or. Well, and, and what do you think your clients can tell the difference? Some, some. And, and so what, what do you think that experience is like where they can tell the difference and you can tell the difference mm -hmm. and, and yet that's not what either of you are talking about mm. in, in that yeah, moment? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I remember a client telling me that um after coming to see me from someone else that uh they didn't like the previous clinician because sometimes the previous clinician would actually fall asleep in session okay and um it's not been my seems, experience seems valid yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what you're working on though you know i don't know there might seem to be some some exposure there to something i don't know so yeah. so um uh, I guess I just, uh, I, I don't want to be providing that kind of experience. And, uh, um, like I see, I see so much of the work that I do as contingent upon my own self care and, um, you know, my, me as the, the instrument of that. And so, um, it fills me to be able to help someone else. And so if I'm not helping someone else, as, as much as possible, um, you know, just checking some boxes or something like that. And I don't want to be doing that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll share with you, um, one of the lessons that, that I've learned, mm -hmm. um, in my clinical work, and then we can see how that might apply. Okay. Um, you know, my, uh, specialty area, um, has been working with, uh, trauma survivors. Okay. So people who have experienced all sorts of different traumas from interpersonal trauma from childhood, adulthood, you know, combat disasters, all sorts of things. But especially when working with um, folks who have experienced interpersonal trauma, and especially if it's something that went on over time mm -hmm. or they grew up in a challenging childhood environment where maybe the parents were, um, you know, not emotionally healthy themselves in some way. Yeah. Those clients are often very, very good at picking up on the cues from other people. Very good at knowing if somebody is being genuine mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. If there's something going on that the person's not talking about. Yeah. If they're saying yeah. one thing, but, but really there's something else going on. And so I think what I learned to do over time is to be very, very transparent with my clients about how I was doing. So if there was something going on where I was afraid that it would be a distraction for me or a barrier, 
what I learned to do was to actually label that and tell the client that. Hmm. So if I was coming into a session and had been rushing around and had a super stressful day Mm -hmm. and I was not really centered in that moment because I had so many things buzzing around in my head, Mm -hmm. I might actually start the session by saying, you know, I got, I got to let you know, I have had a a really wacky day today Mm -hmm. and, um, and I um, got so many things running through my head. Um, and my goal is to be completely grounded and present for you today. And I don't feel like I'm there yet. Would it be okay if we did a mindfulness exercise together to start the session? Mm. Okay. Um, or um, if I found myself um, being tired or, you know, um, I, I literally have, have said before, like, just so you know, I um, had something really stressful happen in my life last night. It's fine. Don't need to go into it. Mm -hmm. But I just want you to know that if I'm a little bit off today, it's because I didn't have a great night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And my intent is to be here 100% for you. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to say that out loud. So if if you pick up on anything, I just want you to know it's me, not you. Um, those are those are just some examples of uh, of radical transparency mm-hmm. that um, where it's you're letting them in on the fact that you're a human being mm-hmm. and that you're not perfect and and that you still are there for them. Mm-hmm. You're not breaking boundaries. You're not telling them what the stressful thing is that yeah. happened last night. Um, you're not getting into the content and distracting from the focus, but you're modeling for them that you're a person Mm -hmm. who struggles and is not always at the top of their game and that you can acknowledge that and, and stay focused. So what, what comes to mind as I, as I give those examples? Uh, what comes to mind is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I can, I read everything you, I resonate with, with much, all of what you say. And I think about, how acknowledging what is actually what's happening is kind of also like a call to arms for myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing forth um, some of my values and, uh, and, and, you know, by acknowledging what's there, um, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more alive. That's, that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, rather than yeah, trying to hide it. Right. Because the hiding you talked about, I think you used the word um, feeling drained. Yeah. Like it makes you feel sort of drained when mm-hmm. you're trying to hide it. Mm-hmm. And you're, you know, like, so again, like what we work with our clients on is that the thing is not the problem. It's the struggle with the thing that's mm-hmm. the problem. Mm-hmm. And if you can embody that and um, find a way to just put it out there, um, you know, perhaps that could allow you to use your energy in some other ways other than trying to hide it. Yeah. And I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of, um, a, a, an example where, you know, someone will want to do some caretaking of that, you know, where a client will want to take care of me. And, um, and I struggle to do what I think is the most functionally appropriate, um, intervention for something like you know me open like you know actually someone asked me recently uh, um you know are you are you tired you know or something like that and functionally because i know that this 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 person's go-to is to take care of of others and um and and the cost of that to this person i i wasn't sure i wasn't sure you know how to respond Yeah, well, so what if you actually just said all that? Like, hey, you know, I, I thanks thanks for asking. I, I appreciate that you care how I'm doing. And, you know, it's interesting even in just thinking of how to respond to a simple question like that. Like part of me wants to acknowledge that, yeah, actually I am kind of tired. I've done a lot going on this week and I haven't been sleeping very well. Mm-hmm. So I want to acknowledge that if you're picking up that I'm tired, I am. And I also find myself noticing 
this pull to try to shield you from that because I, you know, as we've discussed, one of the things that you are naturally drawn to do is to take care of other people. And this hour is about you. Mm. And so part of me actually felt like for a second, I wanted to not acknowledge that I was tired because Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, you know, sort of pull up that, that struggle that we know is already there Mm -hmm. because it's not your job to take care of me. Um, and, you know, sort of all that's just gone through my head quickly. And I, so I just decided to put it on the table. So I am a little tired. And, um, and thank you for noticing that and caring about me. And I'm, I'm good. I, I've got my self-care. So, um, so let's, let's come back to, to what you need to talk about mm. today. Okay. So back to the radical kind of transparency. When, and radical, functionally appropriate transparency. Right. With appropriate boundaries. You're not telling Mm -hmm. her why you're tired. You're not telling Mm -hmm. her, oh, I had a fight Mm -hmm. with a family member. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, and you're, you're sharing, you're sharing sort of your thought process as a way of modeling her own, um, how she might be aware of her own processes and make mindful decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love it, and 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 you know that reminds me of part of what what hurts about not being fully present, and that's like that I'm not taking advantage of all of these rich opportunities to help someone. Yeah, and oh, oh, and and the other thing that came up for me was just you said you're you're showing someone that you're not perfect, and uh, I think that that not only am I showing someone the client, but someone. <laughs> That I don't need to be perfect. Right. You know? Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. because, spoiler alert, you're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Are we at that point in the in the show already? Well, yeah. Well, we're at, we're you know part part of what um, part of what is at least part of my therapeutic stance in act is irreverence mm-hmm. that that there mm-hmm. there is a way to to sometimes just say things mm-hmm. and um, you know when you've built enough, you know, mutual respect and, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, sort of trust. I don't know if we've built that in, in 35 minutes yet, hopefully, but, um, you know, I, I think that, that, that irreverence is, is part of another way of yeah. loosening some of that up. Yeah. Thank you. And so was some of what you said there in terms of, of, um, the, the 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 situation I talked about as far as caretaking and blah blah blah. I I heard I heard some fap in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that um, in in both act and fap um, and very much the the act therapeutic stance is informed by fap. Yeah. This idea that the therapeutic relationship itself provides a context for. Um, working on a variety of these um, acceptance and commitment skills. Mm -hmm. I think where there's a little bit of a distinction is that in ACT, it's um, not necessarily assumed that the therapeutic relationship itself is curative of all things. Um, And I know I'm oversimplifying FAP there. Um, So there, you know, I think the therapeutic relationship is fundamental Mm -hmm. It is necessary for change and act. It's it's not sufficient um, by itself, mm-hmm. but certainly understanding how to use those opportunities in in the therapeutic relationship, those moments as opportunities to practice act principles, is very very much in line with with that. Okay. Yeah, and uh, in line with other things outside of CBS too. I think uh, modern analysis right now is doing some amazing group work and, uh, um, and that's all about the, the relationship and, you know, what's happening in the moment. I don't know what modern analysis individual work looks like too much, but I know what the group works looks like and it's, wow, that's some alive, really alive stuff that's happening. You know? Cool. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we'll, we can, maybe we can, we can break scene and, and get back to talking about the stance if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. What what else should we talk about in terms of the X stance? What's you're, you're the expert here. Tell me. Well, let's let us let us let us talk about um, let's talk about mistakes. 
Okay. So sort of following on that, that theme of transparency Mm -hmm. and that theme of that we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, none of us are perfect is that we also can um, make mistakes and sometimes the client will point them out and sometimes they won't. Sometimes we're, we're aware of them, um, but we're not sure if the client is. Um, and, and again, this, this principle of transparency and this principle of that within ACT, I'm not the expert and I'm not perfect. I may have the degree after my name and at the same time I'm a human being just like everybody else Mm -hmm. that it's it can be important and in fact therapeutic to acknowledge mistakes Mm. too Um, again you don't have to it's functional it it depends it depends on what your case conceptualization is Mm -hmm. and whether or not that would be useful Um, but certainly being open to that um, can be really important okay acknowledging that's, that's a lot of what I'm hearing from you. It's just really doing a, a good job of acknowledging what's happening. Yeah, because I, I think, and I think that as you do that, you can build a really deep and trusting relationship. The person doesn't have to guess what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. They don't have to make assumptions because you're telling them. Um and, and you're working with them on what's what's real and present in the moment. Okay. It's, it's, so, it's so much of what we're talking about here really goes against the grain of our conditioning. At least mine. In terms of, you know, control is the problem, struggle is the problem. And so uh, I just find that it takes, it, take, it takes a lot of work for me to 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 have that as a as a place of beginning or a place where I'm I'm rest finding solace and rest. Yeah, I th- I think that that ongoing awareness and and checking in is is really important. Um, and and even even when you've been practicing it for 10, 20, 30 years, there's still plenty of opportunities to to do more of it. And then, you know, and it, and sometimes, you know, it's really frustrating. Like, oh, I have, like I have to practice this acceptance thing again. Like I'm not, you know, yeah. what, but, but not, but not with this, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. certainly I can do that, but, but not with this, this, <laughs> in this case, I'm the one who's right. Uh-huh. Or this, re- this one really isn't fair or that shouldn't be this way. And, um, and yet, even even those times, mm-hmm. there, there's practice to be yeah. done. Yeah. And and I find it really helpful to have somebody to check in with. Yeah. Um, for those, I mean, what you know, friends, whatever, mm-hmm. friends, colleagues, supervisors, um, you know, because having it just rattle around in your own head is is one thing. Um, having someone else where you can say it out loud sometimes. Um, takes a little bit of the stickiness Mm -hmm. out of the equation so you can see it for what it is um, and get that validation of, yeah, this really does suck. Um, And Mm -hmm. what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Um, And could you have approached that in a different way? You know, having, having people that you can check in with um, who are looking at things from a similar perspective can Mm -hmm. be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering if there's anything else that comes to mind for you in terms of comes to mind or heart uh, for you about stance and and uh, what we're talking about here. I I think just you know the, the words I would use to to sort of summarize the the act therapeutic stance: open, accepting, respectful, caring, warm, consistent collaborative those are the, those are the perspectives that i that i think are useful to um to touch base with on on a regular basis to okay. see to see where where we are yeah. in on those different dimensions yeah well thank you really appreciate your 
uh, candor and presence and uh, you're you're I, I guess I think of you're kind of a you're kind of a surgeon I kind of see you as very precise and uh, and I really appreciate your you sharing that with with me today sure and you know I have I have one one other thought yeah um, especially for somebody who is um, still learning the act approach mm -hmm. getting familiar with it etc or maybe somebody who's early in, in training overall. So like in the first Finding, 10 years? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> first, first 20, 25 years. Um, that as you, as you find your voice as a therapist and your voice as an ACT therapist, I encourage people to feel free to experiment with different voices, mm -hmm. right? So you, you may... Um, hear one trainer's voice you go to a boot camp and you see a few trainers there mm -hmm. you watch some videos and you see some trainers on the videos you listen to these podcasts and you hear different voices of you know experienced act therapists and um, have some fun play around with those different voices mm -hmm. your voice is going to be different from all of those voices it may sound more similar to this person or to that person um, but the beauty is first of all if if you feel like the concepts are really good but the people that you've heard actually um, describe them or provide training like you just think like well i could never do that i mm -hmm. could never say that that's okay. You don't have to. Mm. Like there are, there are a million different ways to apply the same principles, and even to take this this stance that I'm talking about, it's going to come across in a different way for every single therapist. Mm -hmm. And so, allow yourself the flexibility to find your own voice and your own way of demonstrating this stance, and. Um, and just be be open to experimenting and finding how how you can um, live that in a genuine way that is your own. Yes. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really I really appreciate those that sentiment. I really do. And be, yeah, because 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 yeah, I don't, I'm not going to add anything to it. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Um. So. Sa Sanya has a uh, um, website. It's uh, I'll put it in the show notes, sanyabatten.com. Yep. Right? And uh, she's available for ACT consultation and executive coaching. And I'd also recommend you check out a couple of her books, uh, The Essentials of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, as well as uh, Committed Action and Practice with her Bali's co-host. And uh, I'm sure your presence on stage will... Um, it's not completely, I'm, I'm sure we'll see you up there at some, at some way again. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, as I, as I said last year, um, I'm, I'm taking the George Costanza approach. I'm going to go out on a high note. <laughs> Ca but you'll still be around going Costanza. <laughs> <laughs> when you least expect it. Exactly. All right. Uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm getting stronger They take a piece of me But I'm getting stronger They take a piece of me But I'm getting stronger They take a piece of me